Today it's bus wires, and what are your options? Just before we kick off um, about bus wires, um, something that was mentioned in uh, a comment in a previous video, either uh, uh, last week or the week before, about tortoise point motors, and I mentioned that you should cut these with a pair of um, snips, not the um, exudon kind of um, track snip, uh, track cutters, not to use those because I've um, I've damaged these because this is hard to, high tensile steel, um, but to use a pair of these. Under no circumstances, please, please don't use a Dremel type um, rotary cutter. Um, and as many of us have done in the past, especially if you're using um, solenoid point motors, because this one here from Pico, as hopefully you can see, these are very, very hard um, pieces of steel. And if you put your uh, disc cutter on there and try to cut through it, the piece of metal gets very, very hot and in some cases will melt the, the switch bar of the blade and rendering the point pretty, pretty much useless. So please make a note of that. Um, I certainly have never mentioned using um, a disc cutter for cutting these off, um, but someone mentioned it in a comment and I think it's just, just to be on the safe side, then I'll pass it on to you. Right, now for the important stuff, okay. Bus wires. So there's two real types of bus wires. There's a cable type configuration or there's a copper strip type configuration. The copper strip tends to be um, sticky backed and it goes onto, your, onto the bottom of your baseboard. Um, and if you can remember which ones are which, which, which ones you know, your positive ones, which ones are negative, and then you can solder your droppers onto there. The other cable, the other, the other type, is normally a kind of uh, a wire type cable, as this is here, or it can be a single core cable, such as this here. This is UK domestic um, 15 amp house ring main cable, and it comes on a reel, and it's known in the trade as twin and earth, because you have two two cables um, in a sheath and within the sheath there is a bare cable which is the earth cable and what people do is they strip this earth cable back which is quite simple to do and then it reveals the rest of the cable and then you can retrieve this wire and use this for your layout. Um, 2.5 twin and earth is a bit on the heavy side perhaps 1.5 or 1 mil twin and earth um, is this the size to go for? Which takes us to the other question of how much power do you wish to draw? Now, on my layout, I draw five amps. Um, on bigger layouts, you may wish to draw eight amps or 10 amps or whatever. So you need to ascertain the value of current that you're gonna draw before you start wiring up your, your bus. So this, um, I think this is a gauge master uh, transformer kicking out 15 volts AC into my uh, Digitrax uh, controller again kicking out 15 volts AC um, up to 5 amps. Now this is the cable that I use I choose to use and terminology now is key because this is multi-core whereas this stuff here is single core. This we know as cable and this we know as flex both people, we, we call them all wire for some reason, but um, I'm not a lover of single core. Um, the reason we use single core in the house, it's never moved around. It's a static, uh, it's a static item in your house. Whereas with model railways, these uh, stuff does get moved around a little bit, turned here, there and everywhere. If you've got an exhibition layout, then, you know, it's always on the road. Um, and these things are much more durable. Whereas if you keep moving, the solid core cable, if you keep uh, bending it, flexing it for another word, um, it will snap, just part of the way it is really. So you make, you, you pay your money and take your chance. Um, but a lot of people go for that, a lot of people go for this, and this is my preference. So where do I get mine from? And I'm not promoting Halfords, I think they're doing very, very well on their own, 
but I buy it in these small reels. Um, they're a seven metre uh, length and get away, they're rated at five amps, which is ideal and come in various shapes. Well, shapes have come in various colours. Okay, so I naturally use uh, red and black. So that's my, uh, my flex or my, my bus wire, let's call it. Of course, it's not just down to your bus wire. You then need to wire down from your track and your points um, onto, your, um, onto your bus wire uh, to power them up. And we use various uh, colours and shades and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm always sticking with red and black because that's the kind of way I am. And, uh, but if you were going to use um, this type of the current UK colour, uh, coding, then perhaps you naturally would use brown and blue to make things uh, more simple so you don't get confused. Now, this stuff here, I believe, is seven core, um, which means there's seven solid cores of, of cable in, inside here, and they're all 0.2 of a millimetre. Um, and that's the, I think that's rated about one and a half amps and that's what the modeling rail, model rail industry kind of use for droppers from your track onto your bus and it's good practice uh, also we're told that every single piece of track and every point has a dropper attached and they drop down onto a cable and it always kind of to me makes sense um, if you're no good at soldering, then there are from Halfords, excuse my use of my extremely efficient glasses, you can use, um, where's the black, there it is, you can use these small snap connectors. If I can just zoom you in a little bit, hopefully you can see this. And these little snap connectors here. So what you do is you poke through one cable and then let's say your dropper, so you poke that one through and then with a decent pair of pliers you crush this So with this little connector block you thread uh, one cable through, then you thread the other one through. And with a decent pair of pliers, you crush this blade onto those two wires and it should cut through. And then there's a little door to close that snaps over the top so you can't see the uh, the metal connector that we just closed down and that should give you good connectivity then from your bus wire up onto uh, your track. Some people like these, they're a good answer if you don't like soldering. So that's always kind of straightforward. If of course you do like soldering, as I do, there are these little things and these are known as tag strips. This is one that's previously been used and if I zoom in close enough you may be able to see that here on the back of this strip here I have soldered uh, some wire. So therefore if I put my uh, bus wire on here then all of this side and naturally all of these feeds um, will be will have power and I can then connect these up to my red or on the other side my black bus wires. So that's another way of, of, uh, of connecting up your bus wire to your droppers. And these things are relatively cheap. If you want to take your bus wire from board to board, if your if your board is um, if your board is uh, movable, let's say you've got an exhibition layout, then I tend to use these push type chocolate block connectors. They're quite straightforward. You just plug them in, <clears throat> and then on one on the board I would have this one, and then this one would then plug into it into another. Uh, mail connector 
and then into another female connector on the next board. So you just make up um, a jump cable between the two. You don't need to colour code them. If every single one is the same colour, um, as long as one goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, etc., it'll work. And then obviously you can bring in your, your red bus cable in here and your red bus cable out there, your black in here, your black out there. You might bring in your 12 volts DC for a bit of station lighting on another one or signals or whatever. But these are a, a, a pretty good um, uh, connector um, for getting around uh, sort of temporary temporary joints that you need to split up whether you're going to take your layout on the road or you just want easy access uh, into the circuitry. If of course you've got a short circuit you can always disconnect these and isolate a particular board and you can work it out from there. These are a staggering $3.99 from Squires at any decent model railway show. I like these, they're good. So you've decided to, to put your drop wires onto your track and then bring them down onto your bus wire in whatever method, whether you're going to use something like a, a snap connector or whether you're going to um, solder onto, a, uh, onto one of these and then and take it from there. So how do we get your droppers onto your track? Well, there's another couple of systems for that. I personally solder these directly underneath the track. I cut a cut bit of webbing away and I solder it straight onto there, straight through the board and then down onto a tag strip. Some people would rather use soldered fish plates um, and I think Pico sell them and I think on eBay you can buy them because that will be the phone then. Phone call over, we're back in the room. So, as I said, um, Pico sell them and you get them on eBay is um, small lengths of wire, kind of 18 inches, and on the end so they've sold them straight onto a fish plate, which might seem a kind of straightforward way of doing it, and I don't necessarily dislike it. However, when you're using these around points, you get major problems, because if your point becomes unserviceable and you need to change the point, you can't slide the fish plates back and then lift the point straight out. You're going to have to go in there with a Dremel and cut your way in through the fish plates um, and then pull the, pull the point. Um, so, um, yeah, there are, there are kind of advantages and disadvantages. Some people loathe soldering um, and uh, I, I don't know why. I think it's just people's inexperience with it. I mean, soldering irons aren't expensive. People just seem to think that they, all, they can't solder and they, they never will. But I think the truth really is, is they're kind of scared to try perhaps. But uh, there we go. Perhaps if you'd like me to do a, um, a half hour on soldering, you'd like to leave a comment below. And uh, if I get enough support, I will gladly do it. So you've now got your, um, your droppers then from your rails and your, um, your points, etc., cetera, um, down onto, through a tag strip um, or on a clip type connector onto your bus wire. OK, that's all quite straightforward for um, exhibition layouts or small end-to-ends. But what about what happens then if you've got a, a, a what happens then if you have a tail chaser? So if I just illustrate in red where the bus wire might go and you might say, OK, it'll just simply run around the layout. And all the droppers will naturally connect onto it. I've just I'm just putting on the red, obviously there'll be a red and black. And I thought, just like a house ring main, this is the way that it should be, uh, should be wired up. But actually that's not true. Um, though you'll end up with 15 volts AC going through um, what is fundamentally a, a ring main on the bus wire, imposed on top of the 15 volts AC is the DCC signal. And if you had a locomotive, let's say, um, in this area here, then it would receive its signal from both directions and they would arrive at this point at different times. So the way you do it is you actually sever uh, the ring so you don't, so you no longer have a ring. What you do have is fundamentally just one piece of wire that terminates 
um, and fails to join up. So if your locomotive is here and the droppers are coming onto that rail and let's say your, uh, your transformer, your power supply is here, then clearly it will only get to that locomotive in one direction and therefore it will only arrive at one time. As someone who's a lot cleverer than me, than me at electronics explained this to me and I'm not even going to go into. I think the safest way to say is you don't have it as a ring main um, because it kind of corrupts the DC signal that goes out to the locomotives um, because of a time lapse of it travelling in two directions. I just agree with him really. I found on our club layout, which, uh, which is a bigger DC uh, Digitrax layout, um, that the controllers did give some kind of strange signals to the locomotives and we had some, some erratic running and since we disconnected uh, the ring main these problems haven't manifested themselves anymore so I think this is the way to go I'm sure some people will disagree and I'm sure I'm going to read them in the comments below but that's my understanding of it now you may remember a couple of weeks ago I fitted these four tortoise point motors and started the wiring well I progressed that yesterday and have you, as you can see all the point motors are labelled, um, the cables are in running up towards that component at the top which is the uh, Digitrax DS64 which is a, a simple uh, point changing device. Uh, the other cables you can see that are added in now are the droppers and every, so those are the red and blacks and you can see that there are um, two tag strips in place one above the other um, which I'll explain in greater detail shortly. But um, yes, the, the wiring appears complex, but it's not. So I mentioned it's more complicated than it looks, and it really isn't that complicated. If you remember what's on the other side of this board, there are two tracks, again, which I'll show you shortly when I turn it back over. There are two tracks coming down here. Uh, there's an inner, and remember, there's an inner and an outer. Um, so here's the outer cable, uh, the outer track comes through this point first, so it splits it from one into two, and into this one here where it splits from two uh, into three. And again, the inner track comes around the inside, and then again splits there, and then splits again. So I end up with, with six tracks here from the original two that come through. So closing in on this section a little bit, these are the four original tortoise point motors that you've probably seen in, the, in an earlier video. And this is the DCS64. Uh, now I've called this one DCS64100 because this is going to be the 100 area batch of points. The next one will be 200, 300, 400. It just allows me a sort of a sense of, of numbering them to, to group them up so I kind of understand um, what's what. So as a sub part of 100 is point 101, 102, 103, 104. 101 and 102 are on the outer track, 103, 104 are on the inner track kind of straightforward. So that's the points all sorted and as I mentioned in the past the switching power for the points is on the yellow and blue cables and they go into the DS64s and the green cable is always the frog coming up from, um, from the point, kind of straightforward. And then to switch the frog we bring in a red and a black which would normally be uh, track power and then when the point makes it either switches the frog either puts the, the black onto the green or the red onto the green and then the polarity of the frog changes which is kind of quite straightforward. I'll just zoom in a little. So here are two tag strips. There's a tag strip for the inner circuit and a tag strip for the outer circuit because I'm not going to have just the one uh, bus running around I'm going to have two buses and the reason for that is if I get a short circuit on say the outer bus I don't necessarily want the inner bus to short circuit and stop so I can always have one of the buses running and also if I hit a snag and I get a short circuit I know instantly whether it's on the inner bus or the outer bus so it kind of makes it easier for fault finding. So what I'm going to do shortly is bring into the out, onto this outer circuit tag strip. I shall bring in um, the outer circuit uh, red cable, the five amp cable from Halfords, and I'll also bring in the black cable from Halfords, um, and then they will go on to the next board. And the same, I'll do it for the inner circuit. Again, I'll bring in the the red and the black cables to there.
You can see if you look around here, here are the, uh, the droppers coming from the cables. There's obviously, um, uh, well, not obviously, but there's one of the sidings um, and there's another uh, siding here. There's another one there on the outer circuit. Uh, there's the point, there's the frog coming through, there's another, there's another, and there's loads of them because every single rail will have um, a set of droppers to maintain uh, decent uh, conductivity right throughout. So it looks more complicated than it really is, you know, it's all kind of straightforward. There's reds, there's blacks, you know, and those are the, those are the power to the rails, it's just in two separate circuits. So that's what the, the bus wires do down here. Um, so you'll have a red and a black coming in for the outer circuit and a red and a black for the inner circuit. However, there is just another complication and that is that all the rails uh, that carrying a red dropper do not go onto these tag strips. They're actually up here and will go into a separate component um, known as a, as a BDL168 from Digitrax because that will um, entail block detection so that the computer will know where everything is. But um, if you're not into block detection, then the, all these red cables would go straight onto the ordinary tag strips and connect up with the bus wires as it comes through. I mentioned that there's an inner circuit and an outer circuit, and that's because, as, as I said, that if you get a short circuit, only one of those areas will go down. So what you're actually doing is you're, you're breaking your model railway up into something that we call districts. So if one district has a short, the other districts carry on. Digitrax also makes something called a PM42. And a PM42 is exactly what it, what, exactly that item. It uh, splits your input power into four separate districts. So on this layout, it will be the inner circuit, the outer circuit, and back on the old Chadwick, it will be the fuel section and the loco shed. And that will all kind of make sense, hopefully. If you haven't knelt at the altar of Digitrax and you're a, a lens guy or a NC or whatever, you can still use the PM42. You don't necessarily need uh, to be a Digitrax guy and that will um, allow you to put in these, these districts and therefore run a kind of a, a tighter, safer, um, more intelligent network. There we go. Right, so um, finally then, um, these red cables then are connected to all these red droppers are all feeding into here. This will eventually go into the, an item that will go here called a BDR168 uh, for the block detection network, which can detect at, at 16 uh, different areas. So the computer will know when a, a train runs into the station or is leaving the station and going around the, around the, the curves or whatever. So that's why they're all ganged together. Um, if you're not into um, block detection, don't worry about it. Like I said, just feed all of these red cables um, into your, if you're having two districts, inner circuit and outer circuit. And if you're not having uh, districts, you're just having one uh, solid uh, bus right through, then all the reds connect up. And it's kind of as simple as that. What I should do now is connect this all up to a bus um, and then come back to you. And then we'll, we'll run a train on top and hopefully see how it works. So here we are now um, with these bus wires in place and they run from um, that chocolate block I showed you earlier um, and the top two are the inside and the bottom two are the outside loops. So they simply run down here through there and then they split and go onto um, the two, stag two tag strips. Now what I use to secure the cables to the, black to the backboard are these simple plastic mounts which I obtained from Maplins. Sadly Maplins is a thing of the past. Um, but you just get a you just get a big bag full um, and then I secure them using time bond, simple glue here, and I don't wait the the five minutes on either surface before I stick them on. I just put some around the edge, whack it on the board and then let it uh, uh, cure overnight and then I secure the cables to it all kind of easy really um, until of course Maplins has gone broke um, so what I have found instead is B&Q do a bag of uh, 250 self, self adhesive pads um, for £2.50 um, so kind of straightforward put them on there um, 
But what I would recommend is that you peel off the sticky pads and glue them on because what I found on the on um, Chadwick TMD was after about six months the sticky pads lose their stickiness um, and the whole loom starts to drop away from the bottom of the board. Um, so by all means uh, try these but you know be warned that the sticky pad might not work forever but using these um, uh, these pads here um, with uh, Evo Sticks Time Bomb works fine for me. So what I'll do now is simply just secure these with cable ties um, to the board and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wire it up. Right, so there we have it and that's that uh, loom now wired in place. Obviously you'll need to take the bus bar, the bus off to the next board and as I showed in that uh, earlier in the video, um, there are these Halfords type clamps. I just want to zoom into these so you can see. And with these Halford type clamps, if you're using, especially if you're using wires of different sizes, do make sure that you're getting good uh, conductivity between, let's say, the bus wire and the dropper wire. And you can do that quite easily. Obviously, just put a meter across there, set to ohms, and obviously you should get a minimum resistance. Um, and also you can do it obviously from the metal, um, the metal blade that you force in with a pair of pliers. But do make sure um, that you've got connectivity before you seal these up and carry on um, with your bus. Personally, I don't use those. As you know, I like a bit of soldering. So all I'm going to do next is to bring my, uh, my red cable uh, for my inner circuit on from there and the black. Um, and so on and so forth around the outer circuit. So it all kind of makes sense, hopefully. I'll now wire this up and uh, we should all be good to go. So there's a few bits to be wired in. Right, so this is the, the power feed that goes into the DCS, uh, DS64 and I'm sure your system would have its own um, uh, power. That's the Digitrax system switching on. I need to plug the Digi Digitrax controller into here. To, therefore, the, um, the layout then has the commands coming in on this feed known as LocoNet. Um, what else do we need? Got that, got that. I need power into the layout itself. And the way I've done it is, as I mentioned, on that uh, chock block type feed. Um, but obviously I can only, because I've only got one feed, because I haven't installed um, the PM42, the, that, the device that allows you to do um, districts. So I'm just going to bring it in on one feed. So that plugs into there. I shall hop on the inside of that one. And we should kind of be good to go, but this now is only feeding into the inner circuit and not the outer circuit because only two of those cables are connected. So we now need to bridge the inner circuit to the outer circuit and also the red from the bus onto all the red droppers. So with the Digitrack system all switched on now, I shall go from the inner red onto the red droppers and then also from, let me think about that, yep, I now need to go from the, whoops, from the inner black to the outer black. Oh, and I've got a short. I don't know if you can hear that, but when the Digitrax uh, beeps three times, it means there's a short. So there is something clearly wrong with my wiring. I'll be back shortly. Um, I will add to that though, um, because it's in two circuits, there's an inner circuit and outer circuit, and it only happened when I connected the inner to the outer, I know that the problem is going to be on the outer circuit. So I'll have a little look and see what's wrong. 
Okay, 10 minutes later, he embarrassingly returned. When I rewired the whole board um, and I stripped out the original uh, points and all the cabling, I didn't strip it all out. I omitted to strip out this one cable here and it's that cable there that um, is connected um, to an outer cable and not an inner cable. So being red, I naturally swept it up um, with the rest of the red cables and connected it up. So now when I connect across, hopefully we shouldn't get the beeping noise. So red to red, and black to black, fingers crossed. And we're all good. So we know we don't have a short um, and I know it seems a bit of a lash up by, doing the, by putting these jumper cables in but until I have the separate feeds coming in um, from that other that uh, PM42 device then this is the way we'll run it. So I shall lower it down now and we'll uh, stick a loco on and see how we get on. So here's my little class 08 shunter which should do pretty good as a test vehicle. And so we run it up the points, run it up the line, change the points and have a look, a little look. So it's 3105 loco, 3105 loco. And there she goes. The points with her, and that point is point 103, which I'll change when it gets the other side of it. And then hopefully the frogs are the right way around. Otherwise, it would uh, it would short circuit. And then change point uh, 103, so switch 103, throw. And there's that. And then back to the loco. Change direction. and then I'll stop it when it gets onto this frog here. Great, back the other way. Okay, whip it off of there, put it onto the next track. Oh, I need to change that point, that's 101. Switch 101, close. Then bring it back. I'll stop it just in front of that point. So change the point so it runs down into this one here. So switch 101 and it's a close. Nope, it's a throw. Okay, so it'll run down here and into this. I want to Throw that point there, which is 102, switch one, no, no, sorry, switch 102, which will close back to the loco. Beautiful. Back the other way. And then change this point and drive it down there. So switch 102.
and bring the loco back. And we have a piece of dead track. Okay, well, we'll live with that. Let's push him back on. I'll go and sort that out in a moment. And then one thing I do want to show you is what I mentioned mentioned earlier about when you when your loco hits the point that's facing the wrong direction. And it's the advantage of powering your points with a separate supply. So if I now change point 101, point 101, and it's a throw, so this point is now against the shunter. So the shunter drives on and it hits the point that now it's hit the frog and there's a short circuit and you may have heard the Digitrax beep three times. So there's nothing you can do and normally what you would normally do like I say is you lean over and then you change the point um, because if your, if your point is fed uh, from track power there's nothing you can do but as this uh, is fed from the DS64 which has a different supply I should just be able to change the point and then the shunter should move straight on. So switch 101 and it's a throw, so there goes the point, and there goes the shunter. So hopefully that kind of makes, uh, makes sense to you um, on the advantages of, of wiring um, point motors with a separate feed from the track. What I need to do now, of course, is to um, supply a feed to this piece of track, and hopefully then the job's complete. Well, I've checked that piece of rail and there is no, uh, no red cable connected, so it's, um, it was another mistake down to me. But for such a complex piece of wiring, um, as I've said in the past, it's only complex, of course, if, if you look at it as a whole, if you break it down into its small component parts, it's all reasonably achievable. You've just got to keep an idea of what you're going on and you can also do a wiring diagram as you go, which might make things easier for fault, like fault finding at a later date. Yes, there was the embarrassment of this redundant cable being left from the previous wiring job, which um, gave me that short, but it didn't take that long to find, and the embarrassment of failing to wire up that last piece of cable. So there we go. Hopefully, it's a little bit of a better understanding on um, the, how, how bus wires are, are, are kind of run and rigged, um, and, and hopefully you'll understand that the most fundamental thing is that you've got the right size cable for the amount of power you're gonna draw, or the amount of power that your system can put out. And mine's simply a five amp system, so you need a five amp cable. If you're gonna have a much bigger system, then you need to do the maths to get the right uh, power supply um, for, uh, for, for your layout. And then of course, the right cable to go with the power supply. So there we go. Right, hopefully if you've enjoyed that, then you may find a subscribe button here if you're watching on the YouTube app and a future video here and here for you to watch and you know you've got the time. So uh, please like and subscribe and hopefully I'll see you next Friday or the next video. Thanks a lot, take care and bye bye.